That principle of self-determination was encapsulated by these words in the Scottish Constitutional Convention's claim of right. The sovereign right of the Scottish people to determine the form of government best suited to their needs. When the late Canon Kenyon Wright, who led the Convention, addressed Westminster's refusal to accept the democratic demand for a Scottish Parliament with this question, what if that other voice we all know so well responds by saying, we say no and we are the state? His answer, well, we say yes and we are the people, was simple but powerful, and it is as relevant now as it was then. Presiding officer, last May the people of Scotland said yes to an independence referendum by electing a clear majority of MSPs committed to that outcome. The democratic decision was clear. Two weeks ago, the Scottish Government started the process of implementing that decision with the first in the Building a New Scotland series of papers. That paper presented compelling evidence of the stronger economic and social performance relative to the UK of a range of independent countries across Europe that are comparable to Scotland. That should be both a lesson and an inspiration to us. Scotland, over generations, has paid a price for not being independent. Westminster governments we don't vote for, imposing policies we don't support, too often holding us back from fulfilling our potential. That reality has really been starker than it is now. The Conservatives have just six MPs in Scotland, barely 10% of Scottish representation, and yet they have ripped us out of the EU against our will. They have created the worst cost of living crisis in the G7 and saddled us with the second lowest growth in the G20. They are intent on stoking industrial strife, demonising workers and provoking a trade war. Businesses and public services are struggling for staff because freedom of movement has been ended. Our young people have been robbed of opportunity. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government will do everything in our power to mitigate the damage. But that is not enough. Our country deserves better. And yet this Parliament, looked to for leadership by so many across Scotland, does not have the power to tackle the root causes of the financial misery being inflicted on millions. We lack the full range of levers to shape our economy and grow our country's wealth. We are powerless to stop our budget being cut. We can't block the Tories' new anti-trade union laws or stop them tearing up human rights protections. We're not able to restore freedom of movement. And while we invest billions, billions in measures to help with the cost of living, tens of thousands of children can be pushed deeper into poverty at the merest stroke of the Chancellor's pen. Presiding officer, it does not have to be this way. Independence is about equipping ourselves to navigate the future guided by our own values, aspirations and interests. It is about helping us fulfil our potential here at home and play our part in building a better world. And that does take more than a changing of the guard at Westminster. I fervently hope that the Tories lose the next election. They thoroughly deserve to. But on the big policy issues of our time, from Europe to migration, to human rights and fairness for workers, Labour is more a pale imitation than a genuine alternative. Labour won't take Scotland back into the European Union or even the single market, and neither will the Liberal Democrats. They won't restore freedom of movement for our young people. They won't prioritise tackling child poverty over investment in nuclear weapons. Presiding officer, First Minister, First Minister, sorry, could I just have a moment? I have asked that there are no interruptions during the First Minister's statement. I would be grateful if we could have some silence. Thank you. First Minister. Officer, independence won't always be easy. It isn't for any country. But independence will give us the opportunity to chart our own course, to build a wealthier, greener, fairer nation. 
to be outward looking and internationalist, to lift our eyes and learn from the best. Presiding officer, now is the time at this critical moment in history to debate and decide the future of our country. Now is the time to get Scotland on the right path, the path chosen by those who live here. Now is the time for independence. Presenting officer, this parliament has a clear democratic mandate to offer Scotland that choice. The UK government, regrettably, however, is refusing to respect Scottish democracy. That is why today's statement is necessary. The UK and Scottish governments should be sitting down together, responsibly agreeing a process, including a Section 30 order, that allows the Scottish people to decide. That would be the democratic way to proceed. It would be based on precedent, and it would put the legal basis of a referendum beyond any doubt. That's why I am writing to the Prime Minister today to inform him of the content of this statement. And in that letter, I will also make clear that I am ready and willing to negotiate the terms of a Section 30 order with him. <laughs> Presiding officer, what I am not willing to do, what I will never do, is allow Scottish democracy to be a prisoner of Boris Johnson or any yes. Prime Minister. <clears throat> Members, Members, there should be no interruptions. Thank you. Any interruptions? Thank you. Presiding officer, the issue of independence cannot be suppressed. It must be resolved democratically. And that must be through a process that is above reproach and commands confidence. That is why I am setting out today the actions the Scottish Government and the Lord Advocate will take in the absence of a Section 30 order to secure Scotland's right to choose. My determination is to secure a process that allows the people of Scotland, whether yes, no, or yet to be decided, to express their views in a legal constitutional referendum so that the majority view can be established fairly and democratic. The steps I am setting out today seek to achieve that. They are grounded in and demonstrate this government's respect for the principles of rule of law and democracy. Indeed, these core principles, respect for the rule of law and respect for democracy, underpin everything I say to you. Respect for the rule of law means that a referendum must be lawful. That, for me, is a matter of principle. But it is also a matter of practical reality. An unlawful referendum would not be deliverable. Even if it was, it would lack effect. The outcome would not be recognised by the international community. Bluntly, it would not lead to Scotland becoming independent. Presiding officer, it is axiomatic that a referendum must be lawful. But my deliberations in recent times have led me to this further conclusion. The lawfulness or otherwise of the referendum must be established as a matter of fact, not just opinion. Otherwise, as we have seen again in recent days, opposition parties will just keep casting doubt on the legitimacy of the process so that they can avoid the substantive debate on independence which Scotland deserves, but they so clearly fear. That is not in the country's best interest. Let me turn then to the detail of the steps we will now take to secure that objective of an indisputably lawful referendum, and then ensure that from today, we can focus on the substance of why Scotland should be independent. Presiding officer, I can announce First of all, that the Scottish Government is today publishing the Scottish Independence Referendum Bill. I will draw attention in particular to three key provisions of this bill. Firstly, the purpose of the referendum, as set out in Section 1, is to ascertain the views of the people of Scotland on whether or not Scotland should be an independent country. In common with the 2014 referendum, indeed in common with the Brexit referendum, and the referendum to establish this parliament. The independence referendum proposed in the bill will be consultative, not self-executing, just as in 2014 and recognised explicitly 
in the 2013 White Paper. A majority yes vote in this referendum will not in and of itself make Scotland independent. For Scotland to become independent following a yes vote, legislation would have to be passed by the UK and Scottish parliaments. Now, there has been much commentary in recent days to the effect that a consultative referendum would not have the same status as the vote in 2014. That is simply wrong, factually and legally. Let me be clear, the status of the referendum proposed in this bill is exactly the same as the referendums of 1997, 2014 and 2016. The next provision of the bill I wish to draw attention to relates to the question to be asked in the referendum. The bill states that the question on the ballot paper should be, just as it was in 2014, should Scotland be an independent country? Finally, presiding officer, the bill includes the proposed date on which the referendum should be held. In line with the government's clear mandate, this is a date within the first half of this term of parliament. Presiding officer, I can announce that the Scottish government is proposing that the independence referendum be held on the 19th of October 2023. These are... Thank you. Thank you. Members. These are the key elements of the referendum legislation that the Scottish Government wishes this Parliament to scrutinise and pass. Let me turn now to the aim of establishing as fact the lawfulness of a referendum, which, as I have Members. already indicated, I consider to be of the utmost importance. I will start with what we know already. We know that the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament to pass this bill in the absence of a Section 30 order is contested. We know that legislative competence can only be determined judicially. And we know that for as long as there is no judicial determination, opinions will differ and doubt will continue to be cast on the lawful basis for the referendum. That benefits only those parties opposed to independence because it allows them to avoid the substance of the independence debate. Finally, we know that if this parliament does seek to legislate without a section 30 order, the bill will go to court. That is inevitable. The only questions are when it ends up in court and at whose hand. If the issue of legislative competence remains unresolved at the point of formal introduction of a bill, the UK government will almost certainly use section 33 of the Scotland Act to refer it to the Supreme Court after it has passed. It is also possible that one or more private individuals will lodge a judicial review of the bill. Indeed, it was reported last week that Tory supporters are already planning to do so. A challenge by private individuals could also go through successive courts and so be a very lengthy process. Either way, at the point of Parliament passing the bill, there would be no certainty about when or even if it could be implemented. A court challenge would still lie ahead and the timetable I have set out today would quickly become difficult to deliver. And of course, between now and then, claim and counterclaim, good faith arguments and bad faith fear mongering about so-called wildcat referendums will continue to muddy the water, cast up doubt and taint the process. Presiding officer, that may well suit politicians opposed to independence, but none of it would be in the interest of the country and none of it would serve democracy. The fact is, neither legal opinions nor political arguments will resolve this point. We must establish legal fact. That is why, in my view, we must seek now to accelerate to the point when we have legal clarity, legal fact. And crucially, in doing so, I hope, establish and safeguard the ability of this parliament to deliver a referendum on the date proposed. Presiding officer, it is to this end that some weeks ago I asked the Lord Advocate to consider exercising the power she has under paragraph 34 of Schedule 6 to the Scotland Act to refer to the Supreme Court the question of whether the provisions in this bill relate to reserve matters. This is a power exercisable by the Lord Advocate alone, not by Scottish ministers collectively. Whether or not she does so, is accordingly a matter solely for her. 
However, I can confirm that the Lord Advocate has considered this request. She has taken into account the following factors. This government's democratic mandate, the constitutional significance of this issue, the fact that the bill does raise a genuine issue of law that is unresolved, and the importance of ensuring that this government and parliament act lawfully at all times. And she has now informed me of her decision. I can advise parliament that the Lord Advocate has agreed to make a reference of the provisions in the bill to the Supreme Court. Indeed, presiding officer, as I speak, the process for serving the requisite paperwork on the UK government by lawyers and messengers at arms is underway. And I can confirm that the reference will be filed with the Supreme Court this afternoon. Presiding officer, whether or not the reference is accepted, how long it takes to determine and what judgment is arrived at are, of course, all matters for the court to determine. I accept that. As I have made clear throughout, this government respects the rule of law. However, by asking the Lord Advocate to refer the matter to the court now, rather than wait for others to do so later, we are seeking to deliver clarity and legal certainty in a timely manner and without the delay and continued doubt that others would prefer. Presiding officer, obviously it is this government's hope that the question in this bill, proposing a referendum that is consultative, not self-executing, and which would seek to ascertain the views of the Scottish people for or against independence, will be deemed to be within the legislative competence of this parliament. If that outcome is secured, there will be no doubt whatsoever that the referendum is lawful. And I can confirm that the government will then immediately introduce the bill and ask Parliament to pass it on a timescale that allows the referendum to proceed on the 19th of October next year. It is, of course, possible that the Supreme Court will decide that the Scottish Parliament does not have power to legislate even for a consultative referendum. To be clear, if that happens, it will be the fault of Westminster legislation, not the court. Members. Obviously, that would not be the clarity we hope for. But if that is what the law establishing this parliament really means, it is better to have that clarity sooner rather than later. Because what it will clarify, presiding officer, is this. Any notion of the UK as a voluntary union of nations is a fiction. Any suggestion that the UK is a partnership of equals is false. Instead, we will be confronted with this reality. No matter how Scotland votes, regardless of what future we desire for our country, Westminster can block and overrule. Westminster will always have the final say. Presenting officer, there would be few stronger or more powerful arguments for independence than that. Yeah. And it would not be the end of the matter. Far from it. I said earlier that two principles would guide what I said today, the rule of law and democracy. Democracy demands that people must have their say. So finally, in terms of process, let me confirm this, although it describes a scenario that I hope does not arise. But if it does transpire that there is no lawful way for this parliament to give the people of Scotland the choice of independence in a referendum, and if the UK government continues to deny a Section 30 order, my party will fight the UK general election on this single question. Should Scotland be an independent country? Members. <laughs> members. Members. Officer. First Minister, if I may, members, I do think it's important, regardless of the content of any statement, that we adhere to parliamentary standing orders and that we continue to hear the statement without interruptions. Thank you. Signing officer, the path I have laid out today is about bringing clarity and certainty to this debate. Above all, it is about ensuring that Scotland will have its say on independence. I want the process set in train today to lead to a lawful constitutional referendum and for that to take place on the 19th of October 2023. That is what we are preparing for. But if the law says that is not possible, the general election will be a de facto referendum. Either way, the people of Scotland will have their say. Presenting officer, as the Lord Advocate is now referring the question of legality to the Supreme Court, that need no longer be the subject of sterile political debate. Indeed, the subjudice principle and our own standing orders 
demand that the arguments on competence now be made in court and not here in this chamber. That means we can and we should now focus on the substance. That is what this government intends to do. In the weeks and months ahead, we will make the positive case for independence. We will do so with commitment, confidence and passion. Let the opposition, if they can, make the case for continued Westminster rule and then let the people decide. Presenting officer, to believe in Scottish independence is to believe in a better future. It involves an unashamedly optimistic view of the world, the belief that things can be better than they are now. Above all, it means trusting the talents and ingenuity of all of us who live here, no matter where we come from. It is not a claim to be better than anyone else. It is about looking around at all the other successful independent countries in the world, so many of them smaller than we are and without the resources we are blessed with, and asking, why not Scotland? Think of all our talents and advantages, unrivaled energy resources, extraordinary natural heritage, exceptional strengths in the industries of the future, brilliant universities and colleges, a highly skilled and creative population. There is no reason at all that an independent Scotland would not succeed. Nothing in life is guaranteed, but with hard work and the independence to chart our own course, Scotland will prosper. And the people of Scotland have told us, all of us in this chamber, that they want the right to decide. Presenting officer, today we have set out the path to deliver it. Thank you. Thank you. The First Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement. I intend to allow around 40 minutes for questions, after which we'll move on to the next item of business. And I'd be grateful if members who wish to ask a question were to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I wonder if that SNP applause was to make up for the people in the public gallery actually walking out yeah. as the First Minister yeah. Yeah. was speaking. Because Nicola Sturgeon, because Nicola Sturgeon is at it all over again. Yeah. Her eye is off the ball once more. The real priorities of people across Scotland are on the back burner. Instead, the First Minister is putting her plans to divide Scotland front and centre. Nicola Sturgeon has shown again today that the SNP's selfish obsession with another divisive referendum is always their top priority. She will use government time and resources to further her plan to break up the country just when we need to be pulling together and working yeah. as one. Yeah. All of our focus should be on tackling these huge challenges we face right now. Helping families with their bills, supporting frontline services and creating good jobs. Yeah. A potentially illegal referendum next year is the wrong priority for Scotland. Members, we will hear Mr Ross. Thank you. Well, SNP members uh, are unhappy about that. It is being referred to the court because the legality of it is not known. Therefore, it is a potentially illegal referendum and it would distract away from our recovery. It will damage our efforts to rebuild the country after COVID. It is also the last thing a clear majority of Scottish people want. The First Minister speaks of fear. The First Minister speaks of fear. But what concerns all of us is the price Scotland pays for her continued obsession with another referendum. So we won't play Nicola Sturgeon's games. We won't take part in a pretend poll when there is real work to be done. Real work on the global cost of living crisis. Real work to invest in public services. Real work to rebuild our economy. Those are our priorities, and they're the real priorities of people across Scotland as well. But instead of focusing on the right priorities, Nicola Sturgeon is railroading this parliament into talking about the SNP's obsession. 
On the First Minister's watch, this is becoming a do-nothing parliament. Yep. Yeah. Nicola Sturgeon has confirmed today that she will introduce a bill for another independence referendum. But what is she doing about the country's top priorities? Nothing. Yeah. Education, no bills. Yeah. Drugs, no ideas. Ferries, none that float. That is Nicola Sturgeon Scotland, and this parliament is beginning to be a parliament that doesn't get to act on the people's real priorities. A parliament that only exists to further the SNP's interests. A do-nothing parliament with a first minister obsessed with another referendum at all costs. So can I ask the first minister, why should the people of Scotland's real priorities be put on the back burner for another divisive, damaging independence referendum? First minister. Well, I, I think at the last count, Douglas Ross had three jobs. He may be a do-nothing MSP, but this is certainly uh, a do-much uh, parliament. He, Douglas Ross has also demonstrated members, an apparent, thank you. an apparent inability to actually listen to what we said in the statement. Uh, I know that the legality uh, of a referendum passed by this parliament without a section 30 order is contested. That is why I have asked the Lord Advocate to refer the matter to the Supreme Court so that that can be put beyond any doubt. Uh, a referendum that goes ahead will be indisputably uh, legal because the Supreme Court will have deemed it so. Um, and at that stage, uh, any claims uh, about boycotts will sound even sillier uh, than they do now and demonstrate one thing and one thing only. Uh, the Conservatives have no confidence in the arguments for the continuation of the union. Uh, now, we have this strange uh, conundrum, don't we, uh, in Scotland, where the Tories suggest uh, that nobody in Scotland uh, wants the opportunity uh, to choose independence in a referendum. And yet they have somehow managed to elect a majority of MSPs in this parliament who propose an independence referendum. Douglas Ross also says that a clear majority don't want independence. Can I gently suggest to him, if he was confident in that, yeah. uh, he would be desperate to put the question to the people of Scotland in a referendum. Standing officer, my plans are to equip this parliament and this country with all of the powers and all of the resources that other independent countries take for granted and that we need to navigate the challenges that Scotland, in common with the rest of the world, face right now. The truth is, Scotland is paying a price for not being independent, ripped out of the European Union and the single market completely against our will, suffering uh, one of the worst cost of living crises in the developed world because of that, higher inflation than any other G7 country, lower growth than any G20 country other than Russia. Uh, we're seeing children pushed into poverty by a Conservative government that we didn't elect. Scotland needs independent to better navigate those challenges uh, so that all of the focus, all of the power, all of the resources uh, of this government and future Scottish governments can be on exactly uh, that, addressing the priorities of the Scottish people in line with mandates given by the Scottish people. I call Anna Sarwa. Presenting officer, it's important to establish the legal basis of a referendum, but it's also important to consider the timing, the context and the effect. And I think the First Minister gave the game away in the latter part of her statement. This is actually all about the general election and the SNP having some relevance in it than actually about the Scottish people. But it's important to recognise the context of the election campaign last year. We were still a country living under COVID restrictions. Over 10,000 of our fellow citizens had lost their lives. Nicola Sturgeon said during that campaign, that people who didn't support a referendum or independence through the recovery should vote for her safe in the knowledge that COVID recovery would be her priority. COVID hasn't gone away and our recovery hasn't even started. Since that election and when Nicola Sturgeon gave that pledge, 4,000 more Scots have lost their lives. 43 in the last week have died due to COVID. There are over 700,000 Scots on NHS waiting lists, over 10,000 children and young people waiting for a mental health appointment, almost 20,000 fewer businesses in Scotland today than when the pandemic began, 
And this week, the ONS warned that inflation could reach 11 per cent, meaning higher bills and the deepening the cost of living crisis. For households across the country, it doesn't feel like the crisis is over. Isn't it the case that the pandemic Nicola that said she wanted to pull us through is gone and the partisan Nicola Sturgeon that wants to divide our country is back pursuing a referendum that two thirds of Scots don't want right now. Worse still, isn't she using the thank you she was given and the promise she made to lead us through the recovery to instead pit Scott against Scott and focus on her priority, her obsession and her purpose? Frankly, Scotland deserves better. First Minister. Demo democracy. Democracy is not pitting anyone against anyone. Democracy is allowing the people of the country, all of the people of the country, to choose. That is not just the right way to resolve differences of opinion on the Constitution. That is the only way to resolve these differences of opinion. Um, it doesn't surprise me uh, to hear the Conservatives say differently. It does still surprise me to hear Labour set its face so firmly against that fundamental concept of democracy. Anna Sarwar said it's all about the context and the timing of a referendum. He may have more credibility in saying that if his position wasn't exactly the same as the Tories, which is that Scotland should never get the right to choose independence in a referendum. Uh, and let me say, the First Minister standing here uh, is the First Minister who does and who always has believed that the right thing for Scotland to have the powers, the levers, the resources in our hands to chart our course uh, in line with our values, our interests and the aspirations, ambitions we have for the country. Um, I don't want a recovery in the mould of Boris Johnson yep. and the Conservative Party. Um, we, Anna Sarwar is right, Covid hasn't gone away. But I tell you what has happened, a Westminster Tory government that we didn't vote for has taken the funding for dealing with Covid away from this parliament. Yep. Uh, we're seeing a Chancellor uh, take money away from the poorest in our society. Mm -hmm. The way to build a recovery the way to build the kind of country we want, that Anna Sarwar and I probably agree on, is to put the levers and the control of that in the hands of the people of Scotland. That is what independence is about. And as long as Anna Sarwar and his party set their face against that, then I suspect they will continue to struggle in the way that they have over the last decade and more. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Well, here we are again, and what an appalling waste, what an appalling waste of energy and focus this is. Frankly, I can think of better uses of our time, and Presiding Officer, I am not alone. I am sure that those waiting for cancer care in the longest queue on record can think of better uses of our time. Those children suffering long COVID less, left disappointed after they waited to meet her in the cold outside parliament this afternoon can think of better uses of our time. The island ferry passengers, the Ukrainians stuck in hotels, those victims of violent and sexual crime left waiting for justice can all think of better uses for our time. Presiding officer, the first minister is putting disquiet in her party ahead of the needs of this country. So can I ask her why her fixation with breaking up the United Kingdom will always trump the needs of the people that we are all here to serve? First minister. Presiding officer. We have so many Ukrainians here in Scotland uh, right now in the process of being given refuge because we fought to get a super sponsor scheme uh, in order to speed up the process uh, for those fleeing uh, the war in, war in Ukraine. And we would be able to give more refuge to people fleeing conflict and famine from around the world if we were not trapped in a hostile environment immigration policy by a government we don't vote for and doesn't have the support of people across Scotland. And yes, it is this government's responsibility uh, to support the NHS into uh, and through recovery. It is this government's responsibility to deliver for long COVID patients. But I pose the question, are we going to be uh, better able to do that or, or not in charge of our own budgets and resources or still subject to a government that cuts the budget of this parliament at every opportunity? And finally, presiding officer, 
It's not that many years ago uh, that Alex Cole Hamilton and I were actually on the same side of a debate in the Brexit referendum when he told people across Scotland rightly uh, that Brexit would be a disaster and so it is now proving. But the difference between Alex Cole Hamilton and I is his party no longer even says that it would try to take Scotland back in to the European Union. Well, I don't want to give up on that European ideal and aspiration. Uh, now the only route for Scotland back into the European Union and to the European family of nations is by becoming an independent country. Before I go on to the next question, members will wish to be aware that I have 20 members wishing to ask a question in a 20-minute period. Um, I will certainly do my best to, to, to get through as many questions as possible, but members, um, we are going to have, a, a, have to focus on more concise questions and responses. And I call Graham Day to be followed by Donald Cameron. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Following the 2014 referendum, opposition parties promised to the Smith Commission that there was nothing preventing Scotland becoming an independent country in the future should the people of Scotland so choose. So I wonder, does the First Minister therefore share my view that it's completely indefensible for the Prime Minister, Keir Starmer and opposition members in this place not to respect that pledge and the clear mandate secured by the Scottish Government for a referendum to be held on Scottish independence? First Minister. Well, of course, in the 2014 uh, referendum, uh, the leaders of the no parties at the time uh, said power lies with the Scottish people and it is for the Scottish people to decide how Scotland is governed. Uh, until, of course, Scotland might take a decision that they don't like and then they think their right is yeah. to block it. And yes, of course, the Smith Commission said there was nothing in it that prevented Scotland becoming independent. The truth, the presiding officer, is this. The opposition parties in this chamber will always try to block an independence yeah. referendum. They don't do that out of concern for the country. They do that because they fear the debate and they fear the verdict of the Scottish yeah. people on independence. Yeah. You know, I uh, was reminded the other day that in June 2027, uh, the Conservative, uh, 2017, sorry, the Conservative, uh, Conservative government said this, and I've got the front page of the Scottish Daily Mail from June 2017. We'll block a referendum for five years, they said. Well, here we are, five years later, yeah, yeah. and they're still blocking a referendum yeah, yeah. because they fear Scottish democracy and they fear the verdict of the Scottish people on independence. I call Donald Cameron to be followed by Eleanor Whittam. Thank you. Um, given the centrality that the First Minister calls the Lord Advocate, in this process and having set the precedent a few years ago with the continuity bill will the first minister as a matter of urgency commit to having the lord advocate herself appear in this chamber to answer questions from msps on the legality or otherwise of the proposals the first minister has just outlined given that sub judice rules don't apply in scottish proceedings until parties pleadings have been finalized first minister uh, i can't and won't uh, seek to commit the Lord Advocate to do anything because she acts independently. And on this matter, uh, the, the power that she has agreed to exercise is one of her retained powers under the Scotland Act. Uh, but I'm sure the Lord Advocate would be uh, more than happy to answer questions from MSPs. But can I just make clear this point? Uh, the course of action that has been set out today is to ask the Supreme Court to opine on the legality of a referendum, uh, not to make it the matter of opinion, even uh, the matter of very esteemed legal opinion, but to get uh, that judgment from the Supreme Court to put the lawfulness of a referendum beyond any doubt. I cannot imagine how anybody in this chamber uh, could find anything in that aspect of my statement to disagree with in any way, shape it's or form. Eleanor Whittam to be followed by Sarah Boyack. Does the First Minister agree with me that aside from the fact that it is our sovereign right as Scottish citizens to determine the democratic path our nation will take, that the current cost of living crisis with the most vulnerable in society are consistently being failed by the UK government and recognising that the Scottish government is doing more than any other UK administration to tackle poverty and support hard pressed whole households, does the First Minister think that all of this serves to highlight just how important it is for the Scottish citizens to exercise their democratic right to decide which government they can trust to address this urgent crisis 
and our recovery from the pandemic via a referendum on independence. First Minister. That is the nub of the matter. In my view, the right to self-determination is absolute. Uh, Scotland has a right to self-determination and the minute another government tries to dictate uh, when or how often that right can be exercised, it ceases to be a right to self-determination. Uh, but this is not just abstract. Uh, independence is about addressing better the key challenges we face as a country uh, and being able to better fulfil our full potential as a country. Uh, others will argue, as they have done today, that this somehow distracts from these challenges and the priorities uh, that many of us share. On the contrary, independence is about giving us the wherewithal to better meet those challenges. Uh, on the cost of living, as I've said already, uh, much of the world is facing a cost of living crisis, but in the UK it is being deeply exacerbated by a Brexit imposed on Scotland against our will. Uh, that is the price of not being in charge of our own destiny. That is the price of not being independent. And people across this country are paying that price right now. Independence is about enabling us to fulfil our full potential. It is exactly about the priorities of people across this country. Sarah Boyack to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. First Minister, even SNP voters don't want a referendum on your timescale. They want action on the cost of living crisis and they need action now, not division, deflection or excuses from your government, which actually has the powers to deliver the support and change they need. So they do not have to choose between heating and eating. Fuel poverty predates Brexit and the pandemic. First Minister, how does a referendum in just under 16 months help those people who cannot afford their bills now, never mind this autumn or never mind winter? And when will your government take responsibility and use the powers you already have to the max? First Minister. Well, of course, we are using these powers. Let me set out how we are using the powers, just in, in this particular regard right now. So benefits that Social Security Scotland uh, is in control of uh, are increasing by 6% rather than 3%. Uh, so we are putting more money into people's pockets. Many of these benefits, of course, don't exist anywhere else in the UK. They have been established just in Scotland because we are using the power that we have. Most importantly, of course, the Scottish Child Payment. Uh, a child payment of that type doesn't exist in England, Wales or Northern Ireland. It exists in Scotland because we are using our powers. But what are the root causes uh, of the cost of living crisis when it comes to energy? It's fuel prices. It's the energy market. All of that is reserved to Westminster governments. So in direct answer to Seda Boyack's question, what difference does it make? By being able to exercise these powers ourselves, we can do more than just mitigate. We can address some of the root causes of the problems people are facing. That's what independence is about. It's empowering this parliament and this country to take the real action that people want on these priorities. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Ross Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Of course, for the opposition, the time is never right. Will they use every opportunity to deny our democratic mandate for an independence referendum? Can the First Minister confirm that building a new Scotland will ensure that the national conversation ahead of the referendum will be of the high standard, informed an example of open democracy in action? And will she again invite opposition members to drop their empty posturing against the referendum's mandate and instead join the debate? First Minister. Uh, absolutely. Um, the Building a New Scotland series of papers will continue. It will set out uh, the positive case for independence. It will take on and answer uh, the tougher questions and challenges uh, that people want to see answered. It will all be about the substance of uh, the choice that we are asking people to make. It's perfectly legitimate in this chamber, in the democracy we live in, that people have different views and that people will want to make uh, the opposite case. And therefore, my challenge to the opposition, uh, the issues of process will now be determined, I hope, uh, through the Supreme Court. Let's have the debate on substance. Uh, I and my colleagues will make the case for independence. Uh, why don't they come and make the substantive case for Scotland continuing to be part of the union? I suspect I know the answer to that question presiding officer, but let's have that debate on substance and then let's do the democratic thing. Let the people decide. Ross Greer to be followed by Michelle Thompson. Thank you. This statement proves beyond doubt the Scottish Government is committed to deliver on its democratic mandate and give the people of Scotland the opportunity to build a fairer, greener, independent nation. 
The very same Conservative Party have been rejected here time and again are now trying to stop that democratic exercise aided by a Labour Party, which seems equally intent on obstructing Scottish democracy. Does the First Minister agree that pro-independence parties winning more seats and more votes than our opponents is the gold standard of democratic mandates for putting Scotland's future in Scotland's hands through a referendum on our independence? First Minister. Well, the mandate for an independence referendum, Ruskie is absolutely right to point this, this out, that exists in this Parliament is stronger than any mandate uh, for Brexit that ever existed in the UK uh, Parliament. Uh, the mandate is undeniable. Uh, the only question is whether opposition parties and the UK government are prepared to respect Scottish democracy. So far, they haven't, which is why I have set out the path today. Scotland has the right to choose. Uh, I want that to be in a legal constitutional referendum. That's the path I have set in train today. But come what may, uh, Scotland must have the right to choose independence because that is the right of self-determination. Yeah. Michelle Thompson to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Scotland should believe she's hopeless, helpless, worthless, voiceless. This is the ambition the unionists have for Scotland. Their belief that they can prevent the Scottish people from having a vote in Scottish independence is based on the fundamentally undemocratic idea of the sovereignty of the Westminster Parliament and a denial of the principle of the sovereignty of the Scottish people. Does the First Minister agree that attempts to block this right to self-determination and the sovereignty of the people of Scotland cannot be sustained while simultaneously attempting to claim that democracy matters? First Minister. I, I absolutely agree with that and it won't be sustained. Um, the UK is either what we have always been told it is, uh, which is a, a voluntary uh, union of equals, uh, or it is not. It uh, is a structure uh, where Scotland has no legal democratic uh, right to decide uh, a different uh, path from. Uh, that cannot uh, be sustainable. Um, this is about the right to self-determination, but more than that, it's uh, about the willingness of politicians who disagree legitimately uh, to let the people decide and to respect uh, that democratic process and that democratic outcome. Um, I heard uh, some unionist politician, I can't remember uh, which one, they all begin to, to sound the same after a, a little while, um, in recent days uh, say that the thing is they'd, they'd worked it out, that I, I, didn't, really, uh, I didn't really want uh, a referendum and I didn't think uh, that we would win one if we got one. Well, do you know what? I suspect if any of the unionist parties actually thought either of those things were the case, they'd be rushing to call my bluff. So there's an invitation today yeah, yeah. to all of them, presiding officer. Come on, call my bluff. I call Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Jim Curley. Thank you, presiding officer. General Sir Patrick Sanders, in his address to the Royal United Services Institute think tank, says his singular focus is mobilising the British Army to help prevent the spread of war in Europe by being ready to fight and win alongside our NATO allies and partners. Signing officer, these are serious times. Putin continues to invade Ukraine. We have a cost of living crisis due to a global inflation and public services are trying to recover from the pandemic. Now has been the time every year for you, First Minister. But why is it that your constitutional obsession is more important than global peace, security and recovery? First Minister. That is utterly shameful, and I think people across the country will see it as that. Uh, all of us stand uh, united behind uh, the people of Ukraine, yeah, yeah. Um, and none of us should seek to use their plight and the yeah, horror yeah, yeah. they are living through <laughs> for our own political ends. Uh, but I tell you this, President, we do live in very, very serious times, which is why I want to see uh, Scotland and independent Scotland being truly internationalist, rejoining the European family of nations and playing our full part, albeit as a relatively small country, in trying to build a better world for today and for future generations. Uh, and I don't think, uh, I really don't believe that the response to what is happening across Europe right now uh, and the gravity of that moment is in our own country to try to block democracy, quite the reverse is the way to respond to yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Jim Fairley to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Thank you very much, President Officer. Can I first of all congratulate the First Minister and the Cabinet for delivering the voice of the people first? Because Westminster is clearly intent on destroying the idea of the UK as a voluntary partnership of nations. A Tory UK government with only six MPs from Scotland 
supporting this issue by Labour is seeking to deny the democratic right of the people of Scotland to choose their own future. So the First Minister share my concern and indeed anger that there's total disdain for the democratic will of the people of Scotland. And why are they so afraid of respecting the right of the people of Scotland to choose their own future? First Minister. Well, they're afraid uh, of allowing people uh, to choose their own future in Scotland because they are afraid uh, and they suspect uh, that when people get that opportunity, they will choose to be independent because in the years since 2014, of course, uh, we have seen all of the things uh, that were promised by the No campaign turn to dust. Uh, we have seen many of the things that the No campaign said would happen if Scotland voted yes. It happened because Scotland didn't vote yes, uh, chief amongst those, of course, being taken out of the European Union against our will. Uh, and more and more, uh, they see that the best way to build the Scotland uh, we want to see is by being in charge of our own destiny and not having that governed uh, by politicians like Boris Johnson, that nobody even in this parliament thinks is fit to be prime minister. Uh, so that's why the opposition want to block Scotland's right to choose because they think Scotland will make a choice that they don't like, but that is not democratic. Exactly. Pauline McNeill to be followed by Jenny Minto. How can the First Minister give serious attention to addressing the fact that sexual crimes have increased by 15%, the highest since 1971, an issue I know she cares deeply about? Resolving the crisis in legal aid and the fact that the morale in Police Scotland is so low that we're losing hundreds of police officers. If most of her government's attention is going to be focused on preparing the arguments for independence. Does that mean that you expect to put these issues on hold for the next 16 months? I think the people of Scotland have the right to know. First Minister. No, of course it doesn't. And if that is the best the opposition can do, uh, then clearly they are going to struggle uh, to sustain a position in this debate. Uh, after the years of my party being in government, we have crime rates that are at their lowest level since 1974. Uh, this government, uh, with, of course, the support of Parliament, uh, has passed uh, legislation on domestic abuse to make it uh, more possible for people to get justice before the courts. Uh, we are supporting our justice system uh, into and through recovery from COVID. But I come back to this central issue. Uh, we are going to be better able uh, to build public services uh, that we want to see to support the recovery of our public services is if we are in charge uh, of the resources we have to do it, rather than being in the position we are in right now, where we are having budgets cut and constrained by a Westminster government we didn't elect. The case for independence and the priorities uh, that I'm sure Pauline McNeill and I agree a great deal on, uh, these are two sides of the same coin. It's about equipping this parliament and this country to better meet those challenges we face. We have several members who would still wish to put a question. I will try to get to the end of this list, but I would be grateful for more concise questions and responses. I call Sandesh Kulhani to be followed by Joe Fitzpatrick. Presiding officer, one in two of us will get cancer in our lifetime. This morning, new stats reveal cancer waiting times are the worst on record. But what, we, what are we talking about this afternoon? Another divisive referendum. First Minister, Someone waited 277 days for treatment. In Glasgow, someone waited 210 days. So, First Minister, when will you realise that a referendum is the wrong priority? And when will you shift the focus away from division and grievance and onto real issues like addressing these dire waiting times and preventing the resultants and totally unnecessary deaths? First Minister. Uh, this government is focused on supporting our NHS, supporting our public services, supporting the country. Uh, through uh, the remainder of COVID uh, and, of course, through the recovery from COVID. Uh, every single day we focus on these priorities in common with uh, governments uh, elsewhere. Uh, health services in countries across the world are dealing with these challenges. Uh, but I come back to this central point. Uh, a government, a parliament, a country uh, that has the full powers and resources of independence is always going to be better able to meet these challenges than one that has one hand tied behind its back. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. My apologies. I now call Jenny Minto, who will be followed by Joe Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As MSP for Argyll and Butte, I am regularly reminded of the valuable contributions EU nationals make to our communities. I'm also very aware that the tourism and hospitality industries, which have relied on EU nationals coming to Argyll and Butte for work, have struggled to fill job vacancies post-Brexit. So could the First Minister advise 
advise as to our, uh, sorry, the Scottish Government's plans to rejoin the European family of nations on our independence? First Minister. Uh, we want, this Government wants to see Scotland uh, rejoin the European Union uh, and the European family of nations and that is one of the key benefits of independence. Indeed, independence is now the only possible route uh, for Scotland uh, to do that. Uh, uh, we know uh, that there will be processes uh, an independent Scotland requires to go through to achieve that and indeed one of the papers that we will publish uh, in the series that I have already referred to will set out uh, the route to that in more detail but the key point I think is understood across Scotland is that without independence there is no route back to the European Union because not only uh, are the Tories against that we now disgracefully have the position where neither Labour nor the Liberal Democrats want to take Scotland back into the European Union or even the single market. They are now happy uh, to allow the yep. damage uh, caused by the Tories to continue. Um, and that demonstrates yes, uh, that the only route for Scotland back into Europe is by becoming an independent country. Yeah, yeah. Joe Fitzpatrick to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Officer, the First Minister has already mentioned the Scottish Child Payment, which has been delivered by Social Security Scotland from its headquarters in the Yes City of Dundee. Can the First Minister say more about how the powers of independence would enable this Parliament to go much further to deliver a fairer, more equal society, improving people's lives like we see in so many compatible countries in Europe and beyond? First Minister. Well, I think that is one of the biggest arguments for independence has been in charge of our own resources uh, so that we can dedicate uh, all of our efforts uh, to tackling poverty and in particular lifting children out of poverty. Uh, and we can illustrate that, uh, the fact that we have only partial power over social security, we can illustrate how that does hold us back. So this parliament, using its limited devolved powers, has established the Scottish Child Payment and of course now decided to double and then extend it uh, further. That is lifting thousands upon thousands of children out of poverty but at the stroke of the Chancellor's pen, £20 a week was taken away from families on universal credit, pushing children back into poverty. We need all of the powers of a social security system to make sure that everything we do is lifting children out of poverty, rather than the situation we have now, uh, that everything we do is undermined by a government pulling in the wrong direction. Daniel Johnson to be followed by Siobhan Brown. Uh, could the First Minister clarify a point of process lying behind this statement? Did the Lord Advocate refuse to certify the referendum bill as being legally competent? And is that why the Lord Advocate is taking it to court rather than being brought before Parliament today? First Minister. Uh, I'm not going to breach the ministerial code by getting into legal advice. Uh, but what I've said out today, and I, I think members should listen to this point because uh, this point is really important. Um, I asked the Lord Advocate to consider exercising the power she has under Schedule 6 of the Scotland Act to refer this matter to the Supreme Court. And the reason I did that is that I know that the power of this parliament is contested. And uh, if the ministerial code was otherwise, even if I was to bring forward and publish a dozen legal opinions on competence, the opposition would say, ah, but that's only an opinion. Uh, the referendum is going to be illegal and they would undermine the process. So I think it is better to ask the Supreme Court uh, for its judgment on the lawful basis of the referendum. And then nobody can gain say that because it is no longer a matter of opinion. It is a matter of legal fact. Siobhan Brown to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Thank you, presiding officer. As MSPs, we are all acutely aware that Scotland currently faces a workforce crisis throughout every industry and sector. With an ageing population, it is impossible for us to magic up people to fill all these roles. Does the First Minister agree with me that only is Scotland becoming independent with normal powers such as immigration, employment law, energy and borrowing powers, just to name a few, that we can start to recover from the COVID crisis and also really start to address the cost of living crisis? Yeah. First Minister. Again, if uh, you speak, as I do uh, regularly, to individuals, uh, to people in public services, to businesses across the country, uh, one common theme will emerge, and that is a shortage of labour, making it more difficult. Uh, to tackle the backlog in our National Health Service, uh, making it more difficult for businesses to recover. And that has been caused and exacerbated by the ending of freedom of movement, uh, which has come from us being taken out of Europe against our will. And it comes from a highly restrictive and, in many cases, deeply inhumane immigration policy. Uh, Scotland needs to be able to determine 
uh, our population and we need to be able to determine who can come to the country so that we can grow that population because that is in the interest of our economy and our public services and society more generally. And the only way to do that is becoming independent with the powers uh, that independence brings in that regard. Another key argument for taking these powers out of the hands of Westminster and putting them into the hands of this parliament. Oliver Mundell to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, presiding officer. Did Westminster have the final say on the 18th of September, 2014? First Minister. Uh, Westminster, um, and in fact, all of the Better Together parties in this chamber ahead of uh, the referendum in 2014, of course, said that if Scotland voted yes, we'd be taken out of yeah. the European uh, Union. Um, and then, of course, we were taken out of the European Union because we did not... We, because, oh, come, on, uh, come on to an important point, actually. Oliver Mundell probably didn't uh, didn't mean uh, to be helpful in that question, but he has been. But I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, but the UK that existed in 2014 uh, doesn't exist now because we are out of the European Union. Um, and that is why people in Scotland, one of the many reasons why people in Scotland should have the choice. Uh, but of course, it is the case that in the lead up to 2014, the then Westminster government it did respect democracy and agree a process with the Scottish Government uh, that had us accept that we disagreed, but nevertheless agree a process that would allow the Scottish people to decide. If this Westminster Government had any respect for democracy, that is exactly what it would be doing. So I think Oliver Mundell has actually put his finger on the deeply undemocratic nature of the Westminster Government in office right now. And Christine Graham. Presiding officer, does the First Minister agree with me that unionist opposition in here has nothing to do with the mandate? It's actually got nothing to do with now is not the right time. It's actually never. Defending a permanent veto by one partner nation to prevent another partner nation from simply exercising its right to choose its constitutional future. And in those circumstances, does the First Minister agree with me? Opposition parties in here should be ashamed of themselves. Yeah. First Minister. Thank you, members. Um, on so many matters, uh, Presiding Officer, I agree uh, with that. But on this matter, yes, you know, it is entirely legitimate uh, for us to disagree on the merits and the substance of independence. That's the stuff of democracy. What it is never acceptable to do is to try to block democracy because you fear the outcome of the democratic choice people will make. That's what the Conservatives are doing. Uh, shamefully, it's what Labour and the rather misnamed Liberal Democrats are doing. But the right of people of Scotland to self-determination is there and it will be exercised. Thank you. That concludes point of order, Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It is clear to me that the Lord Advocate has been unable to sign the referendum bill, which is why it hasn't been introduced to Parliament. But the important issue is the First Minister was in the position of answering questions on behalf of the Lord Advocate. Given that the referral to the Supreme Court is an independent process, free from the influence of the First Minister, then surely the Lord Advocate should make a statement to this chamber and answer questions about that process. Would the presiding officer, as a matter of urgency, consider this alongside the Bureau? Thank Ms Bailey for her point of order. I have no doubt that the, the Bureau will consider this in due course. Thank you. There will be a brief pause before we move on to the next item of business, which is stage three timetable.